Welcome back to The Real News Network, our series of interviews with Richard Wolff, economist at the New School in New York. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you. So let me show you another clip from President Obama's speech where he essentially says that before anything else can be done, the credit crisis has to be taken on. So I know how unpopular it is to be seen as helping banks right now, especially when everyone is suffering in part from their bad decisions. I promise you, I get it. But I also know that in a time of crisis, we cannot afford to govern out of anger or yield to the politics of the moment. It's not about helping banks, it's about helping people. It's not about helping banks, it's about helping people. Because when credit is available again, that young family can finally buy a new home. And then some company will hire workers to build it. And then those workers will have money to spend. If they can get a loan too, maybe they'll finally buy that car or open their own business. Investors will return to the market and American families will see their retirement secured once more. Slowly but surely, confidence will return and our economy will recover. So in terms of what needs to be done here, uh, the argument against that wages are the issue, although it barely even gets talked about wages one way or the other, certainly in the mass media. But that the real issue is that this is a banking crisis, it's a liquidity crisis, and if, one, if the government can just get the banks stabilized and loaning again, then the, we're kind of going to go back where we were and the economy will start to recover. So what do you make of this? Uh, we're not here to help the banks. I think he is reacting, which I understand, to the lack of popularity for this program that hasn't worked and that has helped the banks and skepticism justified among the people that more of this is not going to get much of a better result than what we've already had. And I, I side with the people who are skeptical on this question. Uh, as I said before, this is a systemic problem, and you don't solve a problem that's systemic by going after one or another aspect of our economy. The banks can say to the government, as they have been privately, we can't lend, no matter how much you tell us you want us to, because the people you want us to lend to can't pay us back. And there, we already and there, know that. And there must be another piece to it too, which is we can't lend because no one knows what anything is worth anymore. That's right. There's no collateral. No, nope. you don't know what the collateral right. is worth. The business is looking at the worst projections for the next period of time imaginable. What business wants to borrow money under these circumstances? And even if they do, the suspicion of the lender is this is a business that's making a mistake and it would be too risky to lend in this bad circumstance even if the business is all gung-ho and the mass of people are losing their jobs at an incredible clip and losing their homes, which is the only real wealth most Americans have. So the banks are looking at a potential set of borrowers that make them hesitate because in a sense, they're seeing the systemic nature of the problem. I mean, they're saying to themselves, what's a house worth? And nobody knows. The That's right. That and it's very dangerous to take possession of So it. what about the plan then to put more money into the banks? Somehow you have positions on their boards. You can try to say they have to start to loan versus something they seem averse to actually nationalizing some of these banks and then using the banks as a mechanism to create liquidity. There are many problems with taking over the banks. The banks like to have more and more money from the government, especially from a government which keeps saying they're not going to interfere with the basic private nature of that bank, even if they take shares as they've done to, to this point, they've only taken preferred shares which don't give control and they'll only take shares now and they'll promise to give them back. This is the best of all worlds for a bank to get a lot of money for the government and very few strings to control what they're doing. But let me give you an idea of what isn't spoken about by President Obama, although I think he will soon. If you wanted to radically alter the situation, get credit flowing again, make the mass of people credit worthy give them jobs. In the depths of the Depression, by 1933 and 34, Franklin Roosevelt bit the bullet and put large numbers of unemployed people to work for the government. Why is there nothing spoken in Mr. Obama's speech or in the media about that which we've already done in America? Well, actually, he does speak about it in a sense. He was, he was saying that in his plan, 90% of the employment will be in the private sector. He actually made a point that there doesn't seem that there will be a, a exactly. government jobs program. Exactly. And again, you're going to be asking the private sector to what? Hire people? The private sector is in the process of disgorging people. The best the program Mr. Obama is after will be to slow down the rate of laying people off. The bottom line is we've had several million people lose their jobs in the last 12 months. 
The private sector is in no way about to hire them back. And no one who knows anything about this will believe that that stimulus plan can put these people back to work. The goal of the stimulus plan is to slow down the disaster of more and more unemployment. Simple question. Why not create government jobs for the millions of people for whom there are no private sector jobs? If they had a job, if they had an income, the first thing those people would do with that income is spend it, and that would revive business, and you'd see many So what's few, the answer to that? Why aren't, well, you'd see many why, few, why aren't they doing it? Many few housing closures. I think it's a political question, as it always is. Where is the power? The power for a stimulus to shape a stimulus goes back to what we said in an earlier segment. If the workers are weak, if their organizations like unions are weak, they're not going to shape the stimulus program in the way that would might involve a massive government jobs program. Instead, that which has been strengthened over the last 30 years, finance, is in there saying, fix the big problem that we created with our wild lending. Big problem being fix the banks. Fix the banks, fix the lenders who didn't lend properly and who now don't want to pay the price for having done it badly. F help them. Well, that's a long shot, but they have the power to make that appear to be reasonable. What we need is to put the pressure on Obama the way the pressure was put on Roosevelt back in the 30s, because he began also with the kind of talk that Obama is doing now, but he had to move along when all of these gimmicks to help the financiers and the corporations did not do the job. Do you think there is a short-term fix needed on the banking side, and would you, what would you do about it? And there's a, Like in Europe, there's a big debate about nationalizing banks to quickly create this liquidity. Well, we have to remember, in Europe, not only are they quicker to do it, the British even were ahead of us on this question of nationalizing banks. But there are many industries in Europe that are already nationalized and have been for the last 50 years. And so they're, they're a government that knows how to work with nationalized industries, how to manage them, how to plan them, how to staff them. The United States has prided itself on not doing that. And consequently, for us to nationalize is a, prob is a process that is very slow, very hesitant, blocked not just by the ideology we shouldn't do it, but by the lack of any experience of how to do this, any practical people who have a, f a feeling for that. You know, I'll give you an example. When uh, François Mitterrand in the 1980s took over as a socialist leader of France, he took over 10 of the biggest industry groups in France in that time, but he had all the people in place who had had years and years of managing nationalized industries to put into place to make them work properly. We don't have that. We are now paying the price not just for 30 years of overlending and 30 years of not paying workers rising wages even though their productivity went up. We are also paying the price for 30 years during which we fooled ourselves into thinking we don't have to worry about nationalized industry, we don't have to worry about how to fix an economy that breaks down. So now it's broken down big time and what you're watching is a herky-jerky program full of fits and starts, most of which have not yet worked. And yet Mr. Obama is hesitant, which perhaps is understandable for a new president, to break away from what his predecessor did a lot more than he has so far been willing to do. Well, in the next segment of our interview, let's talk about who's going to pay for all this stimulus. Please join us for the next segment of our interview with Richard Wolff. Donate today and receive a new documentary film available to members of the Real News Network. The History of the National Security State with legendary author Gore Vidal. Bonus features of the DVD include an in-depth response to Vidal from ex-CIA analyst Ray McGovern, who served under seven U.S. presidents, an exclusive interview with Colin Powell's former chief of staff Larry Wilkerson, and an insightful interview with oil policy analyst Antonia Juhas. <laughs> News magazine of the screen. Living glimpses of history in the making. Hollywood and Washington is a symbiotic relationship. They both deal with illusions. Reality doesn't often uh, play much of a part. I think I saw through the myth of the uh, Cold War almost from the beginning. I was a Washington political kid from a political family. Roosevelt first had radio because he had a, this great speaking voice and everyone liked to hear. Truman proceeded to break every arrangement that Roosevelt had set up 
for a peaceful coexistence. And Truman thought that it would be a good idea. Why not just stay armed all the time? And then he devised the national security state. You've got to go up and swear allegiance to the United States or else you're a commie. I mean, we, were, we had imported fascism. We get Dwight Eisenhower, who said that we have this great military industrial complex. It is a dangerous thing. And he said, this is going to change everything. And the way our country's governed, it's going to change us politically. Along comes Jack Kennedy, who wanted to make his mark, believed in the Cold War. But he said, in this kind of politics, it is the appearance of things that matters. I think everybody should take a sober look at the world about us. The national security state still exists, only it isn't communism anymore, it's terrorism. This is the most serious thing that has happened in the history of the United States. Knowledge is power. We need an honest new system. We need the real news. This is the sort of thing we can build right now without anyone else's permission from the government or from the business community. It's the powers in our hands. If we're not going to sleepwalk into more wars, we think we need to start with a television news network that won't bow to pressure and has the courage to seek facts. And that means independent economics. And that's why we need you. Make a tax-deductible donation now of at least $10 a month or a one-time give of at least $75. As a thank you for your support, we will send you the new documentary film, The History of the National Security State.